Welcome to another message from God's Word. We're studying all the parables of the Bible. Our textbook book is number one, the Bible. Number two, all the parables of the Bible by Herbert Lockyer. This has been lauded by one of the greatest books on theology and the ability to tie all the meanings of the different verses in the Bible from the Old and the New Testament. It's more than just a study of the parables. Let's start with verse, or Matthew 10 and verse number 1. Matthew 10 and verse number 1. I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. And Jesus called to himself his 12 disciples. Now there are, there are church members. The church has been called out. And is being called out. The twelve disciples were the apostles. All right? And he gave them power of authority over unclean spirits. Now these, 1 Corinthians tells us the first gift placed in the church was what? Apostles. And here it is, right here. The church. Now, I have a pocket right here. And I can put my hand in the pocket. Now, if that pocket wasn't there, I couldn't put my hand in the pocket. Now, if the church wasn't there, how did they put place the apostles in the church, if that's the first gift placed in the church? And the church already had a treasurer, didn't it? church had clerks. And gave them a power and authority, unlimited authority over unclean spirits, to drive them out and to cure all kinds of disease and all kinds of weaknesses and infirmity. Now, this is what is called the, the limited commission. The limited commission. Now, were, there were two such limited commissions that Jesus one time sent out 70. Another time he sends out 12. Now, these are the names of the 12 apostles. The first one was Simon, who is called Peter or Cephas. And Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, and Bartholomew, Nathaniel, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector. Remember, he did, and Matthew just got called out here in just a few verses earlier. Now he is a, an apostle. Now he is a writer of the New Testament, is going to be. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Judas, not Issachar, and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And Jesus sent out the twelve, charging them to go nowhere among the Gentiles. First of all, this limited commission is to the house of Israel. Israel had to totally reject Jesus Christ. God knew they would. Israel totally rejected Jesus Christ and they were scattered throughout the world as we see over here on our chart the dispersion of Israel Ezekiel 36, 16 through 19 now at the end of the church age Israel would be gathered back in the land according to Ezekiel 36, 20 through 24 and the church age is finished and then God is going to get them he's going to put them through his washing machine which is called the tribulation period to clean them up a little bit so they're fit subjects in the kingdom of God for 1,000 years sent out his twelve charging them go nowhere among the Gentiles do not go into any town of the Samaritans but rather go to the lost house of the of the the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying what? The kingdom of God is at hand. The preaching of John the Baptist finished off and subjugated the law. The law and the prophets were until John, and since that is preached the kingdom of God. We're still preaching the kingdom of God today. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, drive out demons freely without pay, and you have received freely from without charge and give. Take no gold, nor silver, 
not even copper money in your money belts. And do not take a provision bag. I'm going to make you depend upon me is what he's saying. You depend upon me and you depend upon those people there that are receiving the gospel. And when they receive the God, when they receive the God of Israel, Jesus, not only will he have their souls, but he's going to have their pocketbooks and their cupboards and their beds. Has the Lord got your pocketbook? Has he? If he's got your heart, he'll have your pocketbook. If he's got your heart, he'll have your time. And if he's got your heart, you're going to be hungry for his word. And you're not only hungry as like, like a cesspool, but it's going to be not only will the word come in like a dead sea, the water goes in, but it doesn't go out, and it becomes a stagnant pond. As you receive the word of God and you learn God's word and you learn these beautiful jewels from God's word, share them. I know people that, that were studying and, worry and, and studying God's word and they just couldn't stand it anymore and they had to get out and tell somebody about it. That's what the story is all about, people. The workers, laborers into the harvest. A wallet for a collection bag for your journey. Nor, <laughs> don't take two pair of underwear. Nor sandals or staff, for the workman deserves his support. You get out there, and these homes and these people that are so glad to hear the word of God, they're going to wash your dirty underwear. If your feet... Your shoes wear out. They're going to buy you shoes. If you break your staff, they're going to give you a new walking stick. When you're hungry, you'll be fed. And we're tired, you can rest in their beds. Because God now owns their beds. He owns their homes. He owns their pocketbook. For the workman deserves his support, his living, and his food. And to whatever town or village you go, inquire who in it is deserving and stay there at his house until you leave that vicinity. Go there and stay because God's got somebody picked you out. He's picked somebody out there to support you. As you go into the house, give your greetings and wish it well. Then indeed, if that house is deserving, let one or let come upon it your peace, that is, freedom from all the distress that they are experienced as a result of sin. But if it is not deserving, let your peace return unto you. Whoever will not receive and accept and welcome you, nor listen to your message, as you leave the house or the town, shake the dust off of your feet, Truly I tell you, it shall be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. I remember Brother Madden came and preached for me one time at Big Old Cajun. He got up. He looked around the church. And he said, now, if you're here in Walls tonight, I want you to get up and leave right now if you're not going to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and repent of your sins. Because if you don't, when this message is over, you're going to be guilty of the blood of Jesus Christ. So leave now so you won't have more judgment on your head if you won't believe. That really shocked people in that church. They like their hair stood on end. Especially the lost ones. Pay attention. I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be wary. Be wise as serpents and be innocent and harmless and guileless without falsity as doves. 
Genesis 3 and 1. Be on guard against the men whose way or nature is to act in opposites, opposition to God. For they will deliver you up to synagogues and courts, and they'll flog you in the synagogues. This is the houses of worship. Instead of accepting Jesus Christ's name and his authority and him as Savior and King of Israel and the King of the kingdom, they will flog you for saying things about him. And you will be brought before governors and kings for my name's sake, for a witness to bear testimony before them and to the Gentiles, the nations. He's talking about what's going to happen later. Peter wanted to follow Jesus. John wanted to follow Jesus. They wanted to be his right hand and left hand men. But remember when when John was, or Jesus was talking about John and different ones, and uh, they were wanting to be on the right hand and left hand in his kingdom. And he turned around to old Peter and said, Peter, you're going to follow me all right. Yep, you're going to follow me. But one of these days, your arms are going to be stretched out. And you're going to be led where you do not want to go. And Peter reached that time in his life. He was going to be crucified. He was going to be crucified. And Peter says, let me be crucified upside down. I do not deserve to die like my Savior. What the, when they deliver you up, do not be worried about how or what you are to speak. For what you are to say will be given to you in that very hour and that very moment. Paul, which was not a disciple or an apostle yet, was a ravening wolf. One of these wolves, they said about here, because he went out and killed Christians. And when he was on the road down to Damascus, to that church in Damascus, which preached the gospel, when he was on the road down there to kill those people, God struck him down. He said unto him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Why do you just persecute my own and my loves? He said, who are you, Lord? He said, Jesus, whom you persecute. Oh, what would you have me to do? For it is not you who are speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will deliver up brother to death. And the father, his child, and the children will be take a stand against their parents. And we'll have them put to death. This happened in church history. We know that. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who preserves and endures to the end will be saved from spiritual disease and death in the world to come. Now, Israel was going to go through the tribulation period. Now those who will make it to the end of the tribulation period alive will be saved. And they'll go into the millennial kingdom and be capable of living 1,000 years and glorifying God with their lives for 1,000 years. When they persecute you in one town, that is to pursue you in a matter to inquire, injure you, and to cause you to suffer because of your belief, flee to another town. For truly I tell you, and you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor is a servant or slave above his master. It is sufficient for the disciple to be like his teacher, and the servant or slave to like his master. If you have called the master of those Beelzebub, of the house of Beelzebub, meaning the master of the dwelling, how much more will they speak evil of those of his household? Now, if they call me, when I do these miracles, they call me and say that I'm doing my power of Beelzebub, that I got my dark powers down in Egypt when I was down in Egypt when I had to flee for my life, 
That's what they said of Jesus. That's what they're still saying in their commentaries about Jesus. But I'm going to tell you something. They will not see. He said, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed and holy is he that came in the name of the Lord. So have no fear of them, for nothing is concealed that will not be revealed, or kept secret will they not become known. What I say to you in the dark, and tell in the light, and what you hear whispered in the ear, proclaim upon the housetops. And do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather be afraid and fear and respect him who can destroy both soul and body in hell fire. What a story. What a parable. Now let's go to Mr. Lockyer's commentary on this on page 164 through 165. The parable of the sheep and the wolves. The sheep are those that are trying to follow the Lord. And the wolves are those that are trying to supplant and kill and murder the sheep. We have truth and religion con uh, conflicting. Always false religion has tried to kill the true churches. True churches don't go out killing people to make converts out of them. They don't go out and uh, marry the church to the state so they can control it. This section is taken up with the apostolic commission and how the apostles were to live and act. Antagonism and suffering were to be expected. The master's sufferings would be theirs, but fearing God, they had no reason to fear what men might do to them. Sending the first disciples on their mission, Jesus not only gave them the assurance of protection and provision, but reminded them of their responsibility as his delegates, as his witnesses, as his laborers sent forth to labor, to the harvest. He employed a threefold figure to describe their attitude. Sheep among the wolves, wise as serpents and harmless as doves. <clears throat> A strange description of missionaries and ministers. I send you forth, and there I hear, and there, and oh, the I here is emphatic, implying that Christ holds up himself as the fountain of the gospel ministry, as he is the only great burden of it. How does he send his disciples forth? As sheep in the midst of wolves. I've been there. Have you been there? Sheep in the midst of wolves. The people mess with you because you're a Christian. Do they? Has somebody ever come up to you and says, you're a Christian? I bet if I punch you in the nose as hard as I can hit you, you won't just turn the other cheek. That's what they have the idea of a children of God as, as uh, victims of their merciless hate and aggression. As sheep in the midst of wolves, he had just described the lost multitudes as shepherdless sheep. Now he speaks of his own as sheep who will find themselves among those whom their lot will be cast as witnesses. As a pack of destructive wolves, They uh, killed all the wolves off the Great Plains. And they introduced some of them back in there, and they're getting in quite a number. As the elk and the deer and the antelope, bighorn sheep, all of these critters that were multiplying, now there's fewer and fewer and fewer of them because of wolves. You know what wolves do? They kill California put a moratorium on mountain lions. I tagged the last mountain lion in the state of California. That was legal to hunt. Now we've got problems. They have, to, they have to hire government hunters to go out and do what the hunters used to do. And they paid for a tag to get the lions. 
Now we're paying millions of dollars a year to protect the people from lions. And people are in danger among wolves. They're using, Jesus is using that as a figure of speech, but it's real. You don't put the fox in the hen house. Wolves hardly seem convertible. Yet among these waiting to turn on and rend the sent ones, they will be defenseless, sheep willing to die for Christ, and that the lost might be saved. The really lost might be saved. Don't worry about your soul. But you reach souls that are dead. And the double dead will come after you and harm you. That's what's going to happen. To Christ, the wolves were those who had preyed upon those who were weak, wounded, and fleeing them, as the Pharisees had. These wolves are the same he described as hating and killing his witnesses for his name's sake. But with prophesied conflict, suffering of death, there was a promise of victory and sovereignty in the end. You know, the Bible says, Jesus said, you can move mountains if you wish. You say, be moved, and the mountain will be moved. That's not talking about real mountains, which I have seen mountains moved. Have you seen mountains moved? You just go up there to Monolith, up there to Hatchby. That mountain's gone. A lot of it's gone. They're moving that mountain, making cement out of it. It's been moved. But mountain in the Bible means government, doesn't it? How much has the word of God affected governments? How much has it? How much has false religion affected governments? You can see the difference between truth and false religion. False religion always tries to enforce what they believe on others. The Lord Jesus Christ, we just preach the truth. If they catch it, they catch it. If they don't, it's their fault. You preach the word. But the persecutors, the religious zealots, will kill like Israel killed the church. They would go out and kill the little churches. They killed the church members. But the Lord said, Lo, Peter, you're a little rock, but upon this gigantic rock I'll be building my church, and the gates of hell of the unseen world shall not be able to wrestle her. And lo, I'll be with you until the end of the church age. Those are promises. The church didn't go out of existence in the dark age. It went underground. The churches in China didn't go out of existence. The first, when I first got the website up, in one month, they, they downloaded 1,520 hours of messages in one month. And then the Olympics came, and then there was government regulation. I could see it fall. <laughs> Squelch. Just like that. Persecutors don't want the world to have the Word of God. Persecuting churches tried to destroy the Bible. The Catholic Church forbid the Bible. If you had one page of the Bible, they will kill you and burn you with it. I believe it was Abu Bakr, the first caliph after Muhammad, that went into Alexandria, Egypt, and burned the Alexandrian library. He said there was only one book worthy of existing in the world, and that was the Quran. Boy, oh, what a... the Bibles that he burned. The commentaries of the Bible that were burned in Alexandria, Egypt, the history of the world that was burned because of false religion. And hate. Persecutors may surround his flock as hungry and raging wolves. He would be their defense. To be left exposed and ready to be made a prey in John 10 and verse 12. As sheep to wolves was startling enough. But the sheep should be sent among wolves. Must have sounded very unusual and strange indeed. You don't sheep send sheep among wolves. You don't take a sheep and, and send it out there into a wolf pack. But Jesus did. 
That's what we have in the world today sometimes. Where you are, wherever you are in the world, how well do they receive the gospel? No wonder this section was announced and begins with exclaiming, Behold, pay attention, be ye therefore wise as serpents, and the hush, and as harmless as doves. What a wonderful combination. Because they were to be as sheep among the wolves, it would be imperative for his representatives to manifest certain characteristics. They were to have the wisdom, not the poisonous capacity, of the serpent. And the harmlessness, not helplessness, of the dove. Alone, the wisdom of the serpent is, being, is more cunning, and the harmlessness of the dove little better than weakness. But in combination, the wisdom of the serpent would save them from unnecessary exposure to danger. And the harmlessness of the dove from sinful expedience to escape it. In the apostolic age of Christianity, how harmonious were the qualities displayed. Instead of the fanatical thirst for murder and martyrdom to which a later age gave birth, that's when Muhammad sent forth his people murdering and conquering, their wages were booty and their victims were, became their concubines and their wives. There was a manly combination of unflinching zeal and calm discretion before which nothing was able to stand. Those who serve the Lord best are harmless only as they are wise. And wise when they are harmless. Any man going upon the master's business who lacks wisdom is not harmless. Any man going out is not wise unless he is harmless. In the hostile world, then, as sheep facing the wolves, eager to destroy them, his workers, if called upon to shepherd the sheep and to fight the wolves, must seek to catch men with guile. The guile of the gospel. 1 Corinthians twelve sixteen, And yet, be not only supremely guileful, but absolutely guileless. The Holy Spirit who came upon Jesus like a dove, is the only one who can reconcile the contradictory qualities suggested by the serpents and doves. No matter what experiences overtake the heralds of the king, the grace of endurance must be theirs. Alas, too many give up in the good fight of faith. Christ called his disciples to live a life of service and suffering. The reason why you're left in this world is to serve the Lord. And sometimes you have to suffer, suffer when you serve the Lord. Especially in countries out there, there are places in the world, and I know they've listened to these messages in Saudi Arabia, in Jordan, Syria. I know that there's Christians there. I see those downloads every month. And if you're a Christian in those countries, your life is in danger. Do not believe the old story. There is no compulsion in religion. That was Muhammad's first stand in Mecca. When he went to Medina, it was a different story. He declared war on, war on the world. Bring them in. Put them under subjection. Do not be under subjection to any government or any people anywhere. You cause trouble and you perform jihad until the whole world is yours. That's the story of that false religion. Catholicism went out with a sword to conquer. And they killed between 50 and 100 million people. These are Christian people they killed. Islam has killed 170 million and going strong every day. Murdering, murdering, and conquering. The tragedy is that throughout the ages, Christians generally have preferred living lives of ease and comfort rather than to suffer for Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, we send this message out today. I send it out for those that are saved and those that do not know you. 
for those that are saved to show them that there is something for them to do while they're left in this world that is not their time, but your time. Every day we live, you give us every breath and every heartbeat. And what we do for you, will only that will last. Father, we send your word out. Send your spirit with it. Help convict souls of sin, righteousness, judgment to come. And help this message to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.